The following is a conversation. It has the features of any conversation, such as imperfectly expressed thoughts, ill-considered opinions, and the notions of several sleep-deprived brains. Try not to get your stethoscope in a twist about it. Meandering in the margins of medicine, it's the Short Code Podcast. Weird news, fresh views, helpful clues, and interviews by students for students. Subscribe to our weekly show at theshortcode.com. Welcome back to the Short Code Podcast, the show that gives you an inside look at medical school from the students drinking from that very fire hose, a production of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. I'm Dave Etler. With me today in the SCP studio. Now hang on, Short Codes. I think you're going to be impressed with this group. Hold on to your bippies. Say woo to MD PhD student Riley B and Bush. Hi. Give a hug to MD PhD student Aline Sanduk. Hey guys. And uh, also throw a party for MD PhD student Levi Doyle. Howdy. And uh, we're also joined on the internet by M3 Vijay Kamalampundi, who's here to talk about. His research on the use of race-based algorithms in medicine. In just a few minutes. Hi, Vijay. Hello. Hello. It's good to be here. Yeah. Thank you for coming. We're back from a little three-week break for me. I had a little vacation. And I'm refreshed and ready to come back. Spent a lot of time on the beach. Mm. Actually, I did not. (laughs) (laughs) I spent a lot of time adjacent to beaches because I don't really like beaches. What's your beef with beaches? Uh, You know, they're the sand. Sand, right? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I'm saying that. What did you think was going to be the answer to that question? (laughs) Sand everywhere. (laughs) There are also like, there are also creatures. Skin cancer. I mean, right? (laughs) Skin cancer is the creature. Tan lines. Unacceptable. (laughs) Like, I I have this memory of, so I grew up on Cape Cod and I I, I have this, and and, and before you, you know, get excited and say, ooh, how bougie. I was going to say, ooh, how bougie, Dave. (laughs) The truth is that, you know, we were the people who served the rich people. But anyway, yeah, I do remember being on a beach or on a, in a, in a, in a canoe on the ocean. Uh, off just off the beach wasn't very far and i looked down and there was this giant sea skate like underneath me and i freaked right the hell out because i did not know what this was and do you it, fight or flight over fight flight i flight okay or, or did you fawn the new uh, one uh, did you compliment the skate so it wouldn't hurt you maybe i should have i don't know i just remember paddling really hard and suddenly accelerating to a vast speed <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to reveal some of my naivete here as a southwesterner. I have no idea what you're talking oh, about. Oh no, I don't either. Okay. But like <laughs> is, all I heard was huge and I understood what immediately. Can you explain? It's like a a stingray? Okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I I ate some I ate some seafood. I hung out with family and now I'm recharging refreshed to begin another another season of the Shortco podcast with you listeners. If you have any questions that you want to throw our way, about medicine about the culture of medicine about anything you want really you can ask us about re- relationships we give a relationship advice we're great at that well it's not a really it's not a, a <laughs> we we haven't plumbed that depth for ever but we would love to it'd be fun yeah send your questions to the short at gmail.com call us at three one three four seven short ct we'll talk about your uh, question on the show I feel a little out of practice, to be honest with you. So have a vacation. I feel a little rusty. You should never leave again. <laughs> nah, no. You're just too relaxed. I don't care. It's worth mm-hmm. it. <laughs> so uh, Riley, Aline, Levi, just so happens that you're all MSTP students. So you know you know things about research. Sure. I guess. <laughs> Depends yeah. on the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you got the full gambit, too. You've got like the, the preclinical phase. The gr- full blown Middle shitting a brick <laughs> grad qualifying, <student> qualifying <laughs> exam is on Monday, grad student kind of Woo! kind of situation. Oh, <laughs> and then the kind of And you're checked the, out at this point of yes, research. Yep. You're like curmogeny. Yeah. A little. You're yes. just rubbing it in that it ends. <laughs> <laughs> it's not over yet. There, but yes, there's hope. Yes. There's 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 bench research. Generally speaking, there's bench research, you know. And there's all research clinical research is a question. Yeah, really? Well, I think uh, Vijay had a question that he was addressing with his research. And and my understanding is, you know, medical students in the medical communities as a whole have been sort of more aware 
Vijay, of the prevalence of problems with both race-based assumptions in medicine and the racist history of research in the past that unfortunately continues to be, to some extent, the backbone of our knowledge in in medicine. And I think a, a given practitioner may agree that these assumptions are flawed, but the use of race-based algorithms continues in practice, in part because I think old habits die hard. Vijay, you did some research on the racial influence on a particular algorithm in kidney disease. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you were looking at exactly? Yeah. So I'm not sure if it's just research, but it's it's more of like a teaching module that I put together for med students here. Do I have to rewrite that whole thing now? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. That's okay. That's God. fine. We can we can go with it. Damn it. <laughs> I'm sorry. All good. Okay. Yeah, but it's more of like a teaching module that we put together and it's part of this kind of series of lectures that me and Dr. Joy, Joy Goins Fernandez in the Department of Pediatrics have put together about racism in medicine. And so my particular module is focused on how the EGFR equation was kind of created. What's EGFR? Um, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> so GFR is EGFR, estimated glomerular filtration, right, is what we use to measure kidney function. And it's not just disease kidneys, it's anyone's kidneys. So you go in, you get a blood test and you put it, you know, you go look on Epic and you'll see a, a value pop up. And that value is your EGFR value. It's, it's how well your kidneys fil- filter, filter your blood. So the higher your EGFR, the better your kidneys are doing it, filtering your blood. So initially, like what they did was this, there's this big consortium of people that created this MDRD equation. MDRD is just like the group that made the the kidney, whatever the the equation. And they just took a bunch of people. They, they tried to, you know, inject them with this particular like solution. That was the gold standard of measuring, you know, kidney function. And pretty much what they did was they looked at all these like demographic variables and kind of threw them in an equation and they compared it with the gold standard. And then what they did was, you know, to your researchers, they did a regression. So, you know, they have age, they have sex, uh, and they had race that they threw in there. And they noticed that with these combination of variables, this particular equation now is a really good marker of kidney function. You can do it with the injection because it takes so long and it's expensive, but with a cheap, easy blood test, we can now measure kidney function. So that was the original study that was done in the 1990s, not that far uh, ago. And it's only within the past like 10 years that we've actually, you know, come back to the original studies and looked at why was race included and why is it problematic that race was included? And that's really the point of my module is kind of highlighting the inequities that that equation has brought forward and the real challenges we have moving forward now because of the decades of using that equation. So what were the what were the consequences of that decision? Yeah. So Using that equation for a given, like given creatinine level. So pretty much creatinine is produced by the body and it's, it was kind of plugged into that equation as a marker of your kidney function. So there's an inverse relationship. So the higher the creatinine, the lower your GFR because your kidneys are filtering that creatinine. So if they're not filtering it, your creatinine is going to go up. Well, the idea was originally that creatinine is a byproduct of muscle breakdown So the idea was that black people had greater muscle mass. So Mm. we need to create a way to adjust for that. So to adjust for that, they gave, they added a correction factor for black people. So I don't know how much that is about like one, 1.0, whatever. So for the same creatinine value, black people have a higher EGFR. And now the validity of that is questioned because now you have uh, a person with that same creatinine level having a higher EGFR. If that is questioned, then maybe we're artificially increasing the value of kidney function in black people versus white people. Now, you can already see the very real consequences of that. For example, like kidney transplants, many transplant centers use 20 as a cutoff for, you know, referring people for transplants. And not all centers do this, but there have been studies at MassGen, for example, that showed in a small cohort of people with the new updated equations without that factor, you know, there are so many more people that would have 
actually qualified for transplants that may have never. We use the EGFR value to dose medications to qualify people for certain antibiotics. I mean, these have very real consequences. And if we can't use race in a right way, then people suffer. And that's what we've seen. So it sounds like maybe the more appropriate, if if muscle mass was the was the point, then maybe that should have been, you know, some measure of muscle mass should have been the the factor that was included in this calculation. Interesting. Right. I mean, it it turns out even after there have been more studies now in the past like five six years, even after you correct for muscle mass the equation still isn't perfect, suggesting that there's probably something else that we're not even accounting for, yeah. you know. Are there other dis- disciplines that you're aware of that are affected by, you know, these race-based algorithms? Yes, absolutely. And that's the big takeaway from my from my module. So, you know, we in didactics and our preclinical curriculum, we're kind of taught that race and and race is like a social construct and whatever and we go to clinic and it's being used as a biological you know factor in in giving outcomes and yes i've totally noticed this and it's the basis behind this article that i sent out to the group as well Mm -hmm. uh, by vias which is a physician she's compiled of 12 or 13 different specialties where race is being used as a factor and giving an outcome. So urology, the chances of having a person having a kidney stone and endocrinology, like the risks of having osteoporosis, pulmonology, even, you know, you do your spirometry, your pulmonary function tests, black people, they have a different lung capacity. So they're accounted for with the race correction factor, pediatrics, obstetrics. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's kind of pervasive in medicine and it really hasn't been called into question. I found so fascinating in that article that you had sent us how so many of these equations, for lack of a better term, they you they didn't have a reason to add it in the first place. There was I no agree. physiology. Yeah. There was no basic science to say, hey, we need to add race. So, for example, the muscle mass like that was just a like on whimsy kind of just like racially constructed idea that they added that there was no backup of data in my understanding that that was like to actually include it in there there was no basic science evidence and i that was the most shocking thing to me is that we're just adding these metrics that are for all intents and purposes social constructs in the way they're being used because we don't actually have the biology to back them up yeah literally under every single heading there's a statement like the HA does not provide a rational for this adjustment. Despite mounting evidence, authors acknowledge that the mechanism underlying these differences is not known. The developers of the KDRI do not provide possible explanations for this. So like, you're right, at every turn, they're like, well, we're not really sure, but we seems should- Seems like a good it idea. Seems like a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's so interesting too, and you had mentioned regression, and I just had taken like a biostats class last semester, and listening to how statisticians are making these regressional analyses is they're just adding more variables and like waiting to see, oh, does this make the equation better, worse, better, just keep it worse, get rid of it. And they'll do that for just like a lot of different variables. Sounds like a visit to the ophthalmologist. And it, <laughs> yes. And what ultimately causes a lot of bias within statistics is that we're not actually recognizing why are we adding X, Y, Z factor We're just kind of adding them for the sake of a better mathematical modeling. But that really made me think of, I don't know if you all are familiar with like the concept of overfitting models, Mm -hmm. right, to data sets. So especially like background for anybody who's not familiar, right, especially in the realm of political science, right? There's a big obstacle in creating models for understanding how people will vote in elections, how people view Mm -hmm. certain issues, X, Y, Z in that when people create these models, they'll often use past data sets and try and create a model that fits past data sets by introducing variables that essentially recapitulate the data that they already have. And so what that creates is a model that really well describes past data and you might think describes data that you are yet to collect, but that's not necessarily the case. And that leads to lots of like polling errors and you know Mm -hmm. polling biases and stuff so what that makes me think of is like you know similar to what you're talking about Vijay is right we're taking all of this data 
and ascribing it some type of relationship through these regression models that, oh, having, you know, African ancestry, or in this case, not even having African ancestry, just being black or being perceived as black means that you will have a higher glomerular filtration rate when that doesn't take into account, right, how many other exponential numbers of factors that could lead to that data set that you're using having inflated l levels of, you know, creatinine or EGFR, right? It's it's interesting how you see these overlaps in lots of different disciplines. It's not just political science. Yeah, and seeing, too, just the the end result of this and kind of that article you had sent us, Vijay, is so interesting to me in that it's not just these numbers that, that are being affected, but it's it's who's the kidney going to? Who is having higher rates of maternal mortality? These are actual numbers that are causing the like, human consequences. As I was reading this article and kind of assessing my own biases, right, and trying to inspect or think about some of the racist roots of medicine, a lot of what I, what I thought about, right, was like how so much of medicine today and in the past really does have its roots in racist practices and what it results in is like this pathologizing of black bodies mm -hmm. right in that we are somehow different from one another based on biological bases when that's not there's no data to support that right i think it's also it also sort of highlights the difficulty in changing knowledge or in changing what we think of as truth right people spend their lives practicing medicine and i think probably the basis of their ideas about medicine doesn't change very much unless they really work at it mm. and people are built not i think people are built to take shortcuts and to sort of say okay that's what i, I have learned say. what i needed to know and i don't have to learn anymore and even if we talk about medicine as a as a lifelong learning process you know, people just aren't really, they don't seem to be really built that way to sort of, you know, truly discard immediately things that they learned in the past. Like it takes a long time. Because to... it's, it's safe. It's not that people, you know, use these, I don't know, these relics of healthcare, like with ill intention. They've just become so ingrained and as a result, so convenient. It's it's one more thing you don't have to think about as a doctor when there's like 10,000 other things that are capturing all of your attention. But I agree with you that there is this resistance to change. And, and I don't it's inertia. Know, like, I think it's inertia. inertia. I, it, resistance sort of, to me, says, you know, it's a it's an active process. I think it's more passive than that. I think it's it's just inertia. I was going to say it's it's just a lack of will to change it. It's not like a no, we truly believe that this it's just like, well, this is the system we've got. So if you want it to be different, then you can go and do the work and, and you've tell got to us. spend a lot of energy. Yeah. So does does your project Vijay suggest any ways that medical students can make change then? Yeah, I, th I think the really cool part of this whole project and really why I started is when I started med school, I kind of, and I, I'm sure a lot of my, my peers can relate, kind of felt powerless in the system, especially when I started in 2020 when, you know, COVID was going on, you know, I had little support because we're all in our rooms and Zoom listening to lecture. What a great uh, time. Whatever. Yeah, <laughs> what a great time. And George Floyd, all that, you know, mm -hmm. social unrest was going on. I felt really powerless in, in the system that, you know, that we were perpetuating a lot of these inequities in medicine. It was really refreshing to hear that why we started questioning, especially the EGFR equation and clinical algorithms as a whole, is because med students actually came up and said, hey, why are we doing this? Um, and they started, you know, forming committees. And it was really led by students at the University of Washington when they stood up to, you know, clinicians and said, we should not be doing this and here's the data. And awesome. uh, a lot of other medical centers have followed, you know, have also followed their call, you know, ICON, School of Medicine and Mount Sinai. I mean, there's a lot of med students out there calling for change. And I think it kind of has a, you know, gives us the med students a unique role uh, in the medical system. Not only do we have more time with patients and, you know, and getting to hear from them, but we also have, you know, time and, and energy and, you know, enthusiasm to make a difference in the system, especially when, you know, we're often seen as we're the bottle of the totem pole and all that. I think one thing it 
highlights for me is something that's really not obvious, which is the power that medical students have. I think you guys often might see yourselves as being, as you said, on the bottom of this this totem pole and everybody else is sort of more important than you are. But you do in many ways offer fresh perspectives that medicine that medicine needs. And as you say, you have the, you know, you sort of have the time and energy to 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 do that. So the thing I, I wanted to bring this up from the article because I thought this was so powerful. In the section where they were talking about um, nephrology, there's a quote that says, some observers have proposed replacing, quote, the vagaries associated with the inclusion of a variable termed, quote, race with a more specific ancestry associated risk factor, such as APOL1 genotype. And I think that's the crux of the problem. We are so accustomed to using race as a proxy for what the what the functional thing is that we really care about because it's convenient and it's well, also easy because it's, it's what innovative. we had and it's what we had. Exactly. It's like the thing I was saying about as we were talking was like, in some cases, this works. Like the thing I was saying about is redheads. Redheads do need more anesthesia to stay under. And, and there are documented cases of redheaded people coming to <laughs> during procedures. Oh, shit. And that's how I, I think I'm pretty sure. And that's how we learned that like, oh, there's there's a genetic difference here in people with red hair that we need to give them more anesthesia. And so if we would just focus on that, like instead of looking at race, just go, maybe we should be screening everyone for this specific thing that puts them at risk for this specific disease so that we can just be more act like focus on the function, Criti not the appearance. What you're talking about, I think, is critical thought. Like you, Thank you. you don't yes. just, I mean, you, the, the power <laughs> no, the article is talking about critical thought. I'm just relaying that because I thought it was really powerful. Well, I mean, so when you, when you ask what can you as med students do to make change, what you can do is critically think about what you're being taught. Don't just swallow it and, you know, regurgitate it, but really sort of, you know, think about what it is you're being told and question it. Because that's the only way knowledge progresses is through questions. And what I really respect about Vijay is that he identified a problem and then came up with a solution. And raising awareness is the first step. Like, we're not, you know, veteran practitioners. I'm sure, you know, Dr. Joyce Goins, she has lived this. Like, she has the technical expertise to go, actually, this is a better measure. I, You know, we don't have that. But at least identifying it and then raising awareness of it so that other people realize this matters is what recruits like-minded people to your team to go, hey, actually, I know a better way to do this. Let's work together. And that's what's so cool about this module, which I hope, I don't know if I'll have access to it because it sounds like it's preclinical, right? Or is it no, it's actually meant for M3s and M4s. We just piloted it in preclinical students. So hey, awesome. um, maybe we'll get to take it. And we... <laughs> well, there's, so there's an Mod elective board. that you're developing. Tell us more about how, you know, Aline has a little experience developing electives. Maybe you guys can. I'm happy to help in any way. Every, every project is different, but yeah. happy to help out. What, uh, yeah. what exactly are you doing? So, so we've developed, the, so I developed my module yeah. and Dr. Goins Fernandez has other students working on this like larger groups of modules. So we're taught first module is going to be about the history of, of racism in medicine as a whole. Second one is going to be about women and infant health disparities. Like Riley was talking about, you know, black women have three times higher mortality, maternal morbidity, mortality than, than other races. So why is that? That's what that module is going to be about. Third one's going to be about my module, the clinical algorithms one. Fourth is going to be about, you know, how are we doing research in people with color and really diving into like methods and recruitment of black people in, in medical research and other races as well. And the last one, because she is also a, a clinical psychologist about behavioral health disparities in black people and also other races as well. Vijay, have you taken your psychiatry clerkship yet? Yes, that was the first thing I did. <laughs> Did you notice the tendency for like black patients, black male patients to be put on antipsychotics at like kind of higher rates than, than white psychotic patients? I, I mean, I, I kind of did, but I didn't really 
you know, put my thumb on it at the time. But now that you're mentioning it, like I was going to say, I I didn't observe this myself, but I remember having some conversations with some of the attendings where they were like, yeah, this is actually like kind of a problem in the psych community is that because there's this conditioning, the social conditioning in this country that like black males are aggressive, people going into a patient encounter with a black male psych patient are they have a lower threshold for putting them on antipsych and like antipsychotics are not innocuous drugs like they give you diabetes they give you you know high cholesterol <laughs> they they make you uh, lactate you know so it's very interesting so like i should be transparent i didn't see it for myself but someone did raise that possibility and i was like oh that's very serious actually mm. and like a real example of what you're talking about yeah but Jay, this sounds so interesting. These modules put together, it's I'm really excited to see where this goes. Knowing I won't be in clinic for many more years, <laughs> I'm very excited. You will have it. You both will have a chance. That I will have a chance to do this in the future. So thank Great. you and the team for like putting these together because yeah. it is very important in a world in which medical students, this is the prime time to work on our biases because we actually have the time to do it. To have the ability to have this information readily available will be like miles away helpful here's a question mm -hmm. i have how powerful would it be if this was not an elective but a required class i mean that would be nice there's or no like thread right yeah yeah mm -hmm. oh actually i like that actually that's good yeah like a th like a thread that has to be woven through pre -cl mm -hmm. or clinical education i mean at least at the at the baseline i'm hoping that educators within medicine can also realize some of the things that they're saying can be harmful as well. Professors talk about how being black is just a risk factor for so many things like, you know, pulmonary embolism, hypertension, you know, all these diseases. But again, the question has to be asked, like, is it a risk factor? Is it a risk marker for something else that we're not even, you know, talking about? And I think Dr. Barker, uh, who's our Keystone course director, he's done a really great job of like changing how we educate even in medical education you know, talking about race and how we're educating future physicians and kind of nailing down the mechanism behind diseases and disease pathophysiology. So at least at the baseline, I hope even if this won't be incorporated, there's elements that we can take away in moving forward. I think it's part of a bigger theme that healthcare is like the direction that healthcare is moving in is that there is not like one stereotypical patient who is perfect in all ways that we need all patients to conform to it's more that like by getting to know the patient you're figuring out what their normal is like and the and one of the places i see that play out is patients who are obese like you can be you can have a bmi you know over 25 and still be perfectly healthy like of course you know the higher your bmi is the more you might have back problems or joint problems like there there are objective manifestations of you know life quality limiting results of having a higher BMI but point being that like the BMI is such I mean it's used so frequently but it's really not perfect it's a blunt instrument it really yeah exactly it's not a scalpel it's Nor a hedge it clipper. made for mm -hmm. what it is currently being used for which is even more shocking what's funny is my experience yeah. is that if you have a number for something if you have if you could come up with a number it doesn't matter what it is you will use it <laughs> Yeah. You know, you will use that number to make decisions, even if it wasn't us humans in right. our simple brains, what it was, numbers. you know, <laughs> yeah. especially if it's validated in a study, yeah. like a clinical trial. But I mean, it's the same with like, you know, board scores, you know, you'll use it to mm. determine who's going to be a good doctor and who isn't, even though we know that that's not the best measure of what's going to be a good of who's going to be a good doctor or not. We're going to use it anyway, because we've got this nice, convenient number that, you know, we don't have to think about. Mm -hmm. Well, was there any anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't hit on? I really think we got all of it. Okay. Yeah, we just talked about how you know, educators look at race and also for us students to just, you know, keep challenging ourselves and, and how we think about race, even when we're studying for our step exams and all that. I know we frequently stereotype, you know, like diseases like, you know, FSGS or sickle cell. So again, just keep challenging ourselves and how we study and how we think uh, and we'll all be on our way to being great physicians. Hopefully Thanks we'll be so recruiting much. this fall, so okay. we have to have you guys. All right. <laughs> nice. All Thank right. you so much. Have fun in the case. <laughs> yeah, good to meet you guys.
Listeners, if you ask us a question, it means that I don't have to make something up to talk about on the show. And the show becomes what you want it to be. So send your questions to the shortcoats at gmail.com or leave a message at 347 short CT. We'll talk about it on the show. I wanted to make an announcement that the NRMP is considering a change to the match. I don't know if you've heard about this. They saw this. Yes, they have opened a public call for comments on the proposal. They're considering moving to a two-phase match. So instead of a single-phase match, after which most students have positions, once they're done with med school, and some are left to a sort of nebulous scramble for the remaining positions, the NRMP proposes two complete match cycles within the footprint of the current match period. Mm-hmm. I don't honestly don't know much about it, other than what I read on the NRMP's website, which is a very general description of what they're proposing, but they are asking specifically for public comments on it. So I urge you to, if you if you understand what the match is and the problems with the match, or you have concerns about it, or as it is, or as the proposal suggests it become, go to nrmp.org where there's a link to a call for for the public comments located on the homepage and read about it and then make your comments. Do you have a sense about it kind of right off the bat? I have not heard of this. I mean, it's hard to comment on something that you haven't gone through, right? But my perception is that the supplemental offer and acceptance program, which is what you go through if you don't match, seems inadequate. And the amount of stress that students experience during the match cycle is high. And I think they're trying to address both of those problems. So currently the SOAP process is just... I didn't get a spot. You have a spot available. I want to grab it Can right I now. Get in? Can I get in? Will you, yeah, so like, there's let's no talk. additional yeah. match. It's it's kind of, my understanding, like a free-for-all, correct? It's yeah. a little less than it used to be a free-for-all, okay. but it's still a bit crazy. It's not the scramble. It's more yeah, like the They used the to have shake. something called a scramble. <laughs> yeah. The soap shade. <laughs> Whereas this would be like a whole new cycle, basically. In some mm-hmm. ways, my own insecurity shines through in my asking the question of like, will less people match the first time? Because I, I have a feeling that would be, it, you're adding more people that leave that first round feeling icky and crummy, like they weren't good enough the first round. Yeah. Even though probably mm. by changing the algorithm, it's actually just hoping to find them the best fit. It's not because they were not a good candidate. I just think that you can't help but have that like fear internally. Well, it's just a proposal. We'll see what happens. Yeah, Dave, um, we're really upset about you or I, at you for bringing up this proposal. Hey, look. This is, we are. This is all these comments are at you. I <laughs> As am, if we don't have enough to worry yeah. about. I'm, How could you do this to us? Aline's like, I'm good. This isn't going to change the next <laughs> this, year. Yeah, that's right. This this is, is, yes, this I'm is, just going to tune this out. You guys talk about this. <laughs> I don't think this is coming soon to a medical school near you, but it's coming at some point, maybe. So we'll see I what know. happens. I'm not mad at the attempt to innovate. No, I do. I agree should. with with that. that. I agree. I, I mean, they're tr- making it better. I'm glad they're acknowledging deficiencies in the current process because there are. I bet deficiencies. it's going to cost money. <laughs> yeah, if you have to go through again, you have to pay all over again. Like, I also bet it's going to make some people money, right? <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. I think that there's always ulterior. The devil is in the. I, the devil is definitely in the details on this one, and we have none. So. I want to see like what's actually happening in the math that is going on. Because like, what happens when two people are good for the same place? Like, I'm curious i here's what i think happens there's a gigantic warehouse yes and every student is assigned a qr coded rat that's Absolutely. trained to go after a certain type of cheese and then they just let them go and see where they end up and that's how you know i swear to you i'm just and sometimes a certain type of cheese is eaten before the other rats can get there and then those rats don't get a chance at that cheese and sometimes they throw a raccoon in the mix yeah just for fun just to throw everyone off right <laughs> The raccoon is called COVID. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Listeners, if you ask us a question, it means that I don't have to make something up to talk about on the show. And the show becomes what you want it to be. So send your questions to theshortcoats at gmail.com or leave a message at 347-SHORT-CT. We'll talk about it on the show. We have a listener question from Shortcoat Michalina, whose various pieces and parts have extra holes and unusual colors. Mm. Let's, uh, Let's hear from Michalina. Hi, it's Michalina. I have a question revolving around my appearance at interviews and such and in my headshot. I have 
very fun colored hair. Currently it is red, orange, and pink. Usually it is blue and purple. And in my off time, it is white blonde. I am curious if for my headshot and stuff, it would be acceptable for me to just let it go white blonde and not mess with it too much because there is no way it will get back to a natural hue in time, even in the next year when I plan on applying. Or if I should let it do its thing, like how much does this matter because I understand that there's some conservative views within the medical community and I don't want someone to not pick me because I have more than 15 facial piercings and I have a lot of fun colors on the top of my head. The piercings is a lot easier to handle that for photos and interviews. <laughs> the hair is attached to me in a way that I cannot alter as quickly. Not opposed to wearing a wig. Would love to know what you would do if you had blue hair that does not seem to wash out and had to go to an interview that would change your life forever. Thank you so much. I got to tell you, we, in discussing this prior to the show today, we, man, this is a, this is actually a tougher question for us than you might think. So let's start only, with her the only actual consensus mm. is that we are all terribly conflicted. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're kind of pissed that this is even a question. <laughs> so so let's start with her actual question. Her actual question is very simple. Should I just go platinum blonde, I guess? Right? That's her question for interviews. White blonde. White think, blonde. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's kind of color has faded. Hair is still blonde in some ways. Yeah. She's asking, should I strip the canvas that is my hair? Is kind of what she's saying. Yes, yeah, since I since she can't put it back, <laughs> she can't put it back at this point the way it was. Yes, absolutely. I feel like uh, white blonde is pretty common. Yeah, I don't think it's a it's a problematic hair color. If yeah. that's kind of the question she was getting at, is white blonde still considered or like would still be judged upon? I don't know. Judged upon. Judged yes. upon. Judged upon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, words are difficult, but I feel like it's fine. I think it will be perceived. Thank you. Right. Not judged upon. <laughs> Not. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, so I think I would say that. If I were in this person's position, I would maybe make some concessions, but not all. Yeah. Right. Like concessions that you feel comfortable in ways that you don't feel like sacrifice part of your identity and how you externalize it to the people around you, because that's important in interviews, too. Right. You want to come off as genuine and and, you know, like you're not trying to put on a fake face. Right. Right. Or in this and case, now we're okay. getting into the part of the question that made us like really conflicted. Yeah, we're, we're kind of dancing around the real question. This is why my yes. words are not coming as easily because we we're did so discuss difficult. So I mean, let me, let, me, let, me, is. let me try to sum this up. We did have a discussion before today's show about this question. Usually we kind of go in cold to some of these questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we've been trying not to try to do that a little less lately on the podcast. I'm gonna put our big, big podcast pants on it no we needed to limber up for this one but, we needed to stretch let me try to sum up <laughs> the discussion we'll see if i can do it we all find it abhorrent that you can't just let whatever flag you want to fly fly I, I don't know if i agree with that word uh oh we're already getting uh, into yeah. conflict. <laughs> yeah. okay we're already fighting about okay, the abhorrent. semantics uh, i find it i find it unfair it's, un yes. it's yes. unfair it's unfair it's unsatisfying we all want you to be who you are and have you be accepted for that. And you clearly, you did send us some pictures and we were grateful to get them because it, because it basically, you know, it, it, clar it clarified things it, quite it, it a bit. Clarified that, it clarified yeah. that, it, that, 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 and, and your follow-up comments to, to the question clarified that, you know, this is part of who you see yourself. This is part of your identity. Right. And we want you to be accepted and loved for who you are. And that's your identity. 
so so the problem is is that you want to get into medical school and at its heart medical school has two things you're being judged and also it's a numbers game because more people apply to medical school that can possibly get in so it would be irresponsible of us maybe to say yeah do whatever the f you want can i offer like now that i've ruminated on this for five more than five minutes i'm going to offer like two different perspectives that maybe collectively we can bridge throughout medicine you are going to be asked countless times to sacrifice portions of your identity to better fit into the mold of a medical professional, right? And I don't necessarily think that it's wise to allow yourself to start making those concessions before you're even into a program. You're still an applicant, right? I think that the way that we express our identities and externalize ourselves is very intimate and very important to who we are, and it's important to express that no matter the company that you're around, right? So I think that in some ways it may be a very valid approach to hold your cards close, right? And maybe not necessarily divulge all this information about yourself during the application, but show up to any interviews that you receive and dare them to tell you that you shouldn't be there because of how you look. And so part of me wants to say that, right? But another perspective is that, you know, we operate in a system that we have very little control over. And if you want to change the rules of the game, you have to qualify as a player first, right? So you have to be able to jump through the hoops that are set in front of you if you want to actually enact change. So I think those are two very disparate perceptions and perspectives, right? And like we said, I'm very saddened that you have to be taking these thoughts into consideration when you haven't necessarily even applied yet. But like, I think in, in total, we all agree that you, your perspective and you as an individual are valid and belong in medicine. And many patients will be very happy to see somebody like you reflected in their physician one day. But getting to that point can be kind of tricky. You know, in, in, in tossing around this question yesterday i talked with kate and uh kate's a rebel <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, kate is the writing and humanities program director and her lens to all this is well what makes you you if this is what makes you you then how awful to say that you should moderate that Provi provided it doesn't intervene in the core values of medicine. Well, here's the thing. What I was thinking is, you know, in, you're going to get, Aline, you, you can probably talk about this. In your training, you're going to get, especially in clinical years, you're going to get a lot of feedback about you. You're going to get a lot of, I mean, basically what it comes down to is a lot of judgment. Mm. You know, are you doing the right thing, basically, is what it comes down to. But in the end, you'll make decisions based on probably three things that I can think of. What's in the best interest of your patients, what's important to you and your identity, and what's important to your mentors and your teacher. How you order those three things in importance is up to you. Uh, some of the feedback that you get, you will discard and say, okay, great, thanks for that. But I'm not, I don't agree. But really what's important in medicine is the patient. And part of your job as a physician is to keep your patient coming back so that they can get, so that they can be healthy, basically. And if what you're doing impedes that, then that can be a problem that you might want to think about. If it doesn't, then, you know, good. And if it makes them more likely to come back, then you're doing awesome. I was just going to say, I really want to emphasize that last part, too, because 
Michalina, you we did actually get to see a photo of you and you have an incredibly awesome look and like Yeah, we maybe, kinda we kinda love it. Yeah, we kinda <laughs> we love, it. love it. For the record, now I want to dye my hair some more fun colors. But regardless, I think I've been thinking about that lately, but <laughs> before before Michalina, I'm fifty two years old. I've been kind of, <laughs> I've been kind of we thinking about it. We would also love to see. Why are you game. wasting time? I don't Let's know. Do it right like, now. like I'm not a doctor, I can do what the f I want. <laughs> But I think this idea that we are seeking in a lot of medical worlds is that we want to increase the diversity of our practitioners. We want that. And that doesn't just come in terms of increasing diversity of race. It doesn't come just in increasing diversity, including LGBTQ practitioners, but also including identities and personalities that people really jive with. And I think what we ultimately saw in you is that there's a subset of the patient population that would feel so welcomed in your care mm -hmm. and to have you in the room when they come in. And that is a superpower that you have in having this identity that you may feel worried may shine poorly upon you in these medical school interviews. So kind of like Levi was mentioning, don't give all your cards out at once, but don't be afraid to let that superpower just like dwindle away because just like every other superhero, and I can't believe I'm using a superhero metaphor, but not everyone's going to understand you and your identity for what it is and for how you show up. Uh, what you can do, though, is make yourself really strong in every other area, because we were also just thinking about like a thought experiment. How many times is a really awesome applicant going to be turned away just from the way they look? Kate wanted you to use this in your application. Actually, <laughs> she really wanted you to, you yeah. know, lean in and during in your personal statement and in your application materials, say, this is who I am. Yeah, right. I am the living embodiment it. of being who you are despite the judgment of other people and i think my patients can really benefit from that and here's why i love rainbows so much i want it to be one <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah no uh, i agree and i think aline really mentioned something too in the beginning or not in the beginning you guys didn't hear this but when we were talking <laughs> and that it it is gonna take some like personal reflection to think about is this identity that you uh, are outwardly displaying now the kind of truest version of the identity that you would like to display? Maybe Understanding yeah. where your values lie in your personal identification and the yeah. way you are identifying. Because if maybe, and you kind of were mentioning like, oh, I'm thinking about maybe having my hair go back to like this bleach blonde look. If you really feel strongly that part of your identity is the colorful hair, then make that part of your identity. But if that is more so an outward expression of who you are at this current time, then maybe the blonde hair is a actual truer expression of the identity over time. And this is all like my kind of prompts for you, Michalina, to think about where do your values lie in the way you would like to kind of have this outward persona. I think you Hopefully articulated I... that really nicely. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, the way that I had put it, I think we said a lot of things that were just podcast gold. We had a podcast before the podcast because <laughs> of you, been this yeah. whole time. <laughs> well, something we were talking about is, you know, if Mick, if if Michalina feels strongly that this is how she's going to dress and express herself for the rest of her life then the truest way of knowing where she's going to fit in is to present this way in her interviews but if there's any part of her heart that feels like this might be a temporary choice like a temporary taste that she has that will evolve over time it would be so tragic to close the door on a career because of something that is going to be different in 10 years. Yeah. And that's a question only she can answer. Yeah. But if, if, if that's how she plans on dressing to work every day, I, More power. try it and try, yeah, try it and let us know, you know, I don't know. I don't know how that would shake out. There are some things to say though, that our identities do shift a lot over time. Like, we all wore low rise pants 20 years ago, and now I would never dare to wear low rise pants. I know, look at your mom pants. jeans. Yeah, right? I got mom jeans. Like, why would I ever wear a low rise pant? And so I think, like, it is okay in some ways to accept that, like, you don't need to know where you're going to be in 10 years. Because I think that is, that's a hard prompt, like, the more I've thought about it. But if you do feel like maybe there are aspects that, of your identity that does just love changing constantly, and you see yourself evolving over time with your outward appearance, like, Yes, do that. But it is also okay to accept that 
where you are now is not likely to be what you'll look like in 10 years. And so I think humans should accept that about other people. I wonder sometimes how much like admissions people have to look sans human. I know they do. I don't know. Maybe that's a bold thing to say, but yeah. you know, here at, and- here at Iowa, the, the admissions process is apparently different from other schools. There is a strong firewall between interviewers and the committee that chooses whether to have you enter med school. Oh, um, and it's for reasons like this. It seems fairer to us to do that. And it's an oddity among medical schools, apparently. I didn't realize how odd it was, but I was talking to Amy and she said, we're kind of a black sheep in some ways to compared to other schools. They think we're crazy. Hmm. I want to come back to something Levi said at the beginning, which I found so astute. It's like, first, clear that first hurdle and prove that you belong, that you have the values, you have the the moral compass, you have the you know, the mastery of the material to be a good med student and a future good doctor and then show them that part because f- first impressions matter. Mm-hmm. It, I keep the, the thing I keep coming back. I remember my mom saying this to me when I was in high school, which is, you know, when you dress a certain way, you are empowering other people to close the door on seeing you in any other way. You are really shaping the way that they're going to look at you forever. And it is impossible to recreate first impression unless someone has a brain injury and, you know, their memory. I find you can't count on that. (laughs) You know, I mean, unless, you know, under certain circumstances. But the point being that, like, people remember the first thing about you forever. And so controlling what is the first thing that they learn about this person will kind of set them up to be like, okay, you know, I know they can do it. I know their heart's in the right place and this isn't technically going to get in the way of them doing a good job. So maybe we're not mad at this. Yeah. Here's my brainwave. Your brainwave. This would have been more valid. I realized when most schools were doing online interviews, but I think a lot still are. I don't know. A lot still. are. Okay. So here's what you do. Make sure you get one of them online interviews, download onto your computer software that controls the uh, controls your camera and during the interview just start off at a low brightness and just slowly (laughs) increase (laughs) the brightness until your full self is revealed extend that you know like they say most people have develop their impression of you within like you know whatever three seconds right just extend that three seconds over time so they'll be You're like trying to mind hack so the interview. Yeah. Or they'll start out with like, hmm, her her camera's awfully uh, awfully dim, but it's probably you know just a problem with her equipment or whatever. <laughs> and then slowly over time, your brightness increases, and then they get, and then by the end they get the full effect, and they've been just inoculated. <laughs> Or we could love is blind this thing. Picture this. <laughs> picture, med school, <laughs> picture this. Picture world. Med school interviews. You don't actually get to see the person. Yeah. You come to med school. You have a two month trial. You have like to see if you fit. The trial isn't necessary. I'm thinking trying to fit this into Love is Blind. And at the end, you get (laughs) to marry the the med school or not. We're workshopping it. We're workshopping it. (laughs) This is a brand new idea that just happened about two seconds ago. Uh Uh-huh. Those are the best ideas. Yeah. Blind interviews. No faces. Or everyone wears a like a like a like a like a sheet over their body with like the eyes cut out. Right. (laughs) Or or a gun. the, the, like a ghost, ghost yeah, yeah exactly okay. I, I was i was trying to be pc right we yeah. don't want to we don't want to alienate poltergeist use <laughs> use software that allows you to select a emoji of yourself mm. oh. use a filter yeah, oh there must a, be an then, instagram filter but yeah. then there's going to be like okay just wait for the sdn people to try and game which emoji to use for yeah best, there's gonna right? be well they'll all be i mean they'll thing. they'll all be like well, the doctor emoji obviously right. yeah the, <laughs> right? you know doctor emoji it's a white male <laughs> obviously i feel like at this point we're encouraging her to catfish the shit out of me <laughs> yeah, yeah i know <laughs> which yeah. is not what we're not Think saying a book it's not a page out of catfish love is blind okay so I want, yeah, I want to offer maybe some very concrete advice Okay. because yes. I feel like that's what's helpful, right? And you yeah. can disagree with it as much as you'd like. You're not going to hurt my feelings because I come from a very, you know, I have a very narrow perspective and that's totally cool. I acknowledge it. So like, I want to start off by saying that, first of all, we were chatting before as we've been alluding to many times <laughs> that, you know, like 
on med twitter you see residents and attendings and chairs of departments that look a lot like you in a lot of ways they'll like have crazy hair they'll have piercings they'll have tattoos like you know there is a place for you here and there are other people you'll see yourself reflected at some point in your career hopefully in people who are above you that being said if i were in your specific situ situation what i might do is kind of like i said hold my cards close at if you were to which i expect you would get interviews right i believe in you right you're gonna get in a whole bunch of interviews i might if i felt that the hair was something that was really important to me i would let my hair be as crazy as i wanted right maybe take out some of the piercings have a little bit more like i don't want to say socially acceptable i'm trying to find the right conventional sub sub conventional, conventional makeup yeah right know. or no makeup at all but right i think like try and be a palatable quote-unquote version of yourself to as many people as possible to get your foot in the door <laughs> that you can and also then, live with exactly you that know? you can also live with because you we don't, don't feel as sacrificing your values and the way you would like to be like liked yeah outwardly exactly perceived. and then as soon as you get into med school you do whatever yeah, you want yeah. like, oh you know. they're not getting rid of you okay <laughs> yeah no, so that's what that's what my very concrete advice that's like very specific to my narrow perspective that's what I would do. And hopefully that maybe helps you. I don't know. I always feel like it helps to hear what other people would do in your situation. Let her know that we all like if if she takes nothing else away from this, like we all think her look is dope. Like mm -hmm. she looks so rad. Now, having said that, so I'm <laughs> clearly the oldest person in the room and I have oh, well. a little more. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that that's the case, but okay. Emotionally. Oh, okay. Zing. The so, <laughs> no, I'm just saying. <laughs> so, like, so the thing I was thinking about is I don't think everyone is entitled to be their most comfortable in every setting and have other people accept them exactly as they are. You, you know, I was thinking about this. That's too. a slippery slope. Because, look, we all decide what face we're going to use in every situation in every context you know we don't we don't behave in the same way to a police officer as we would to our lover you know like it's exactly we all modify our our we all change our masks you as know, needed and not just because it's partially you know a requirement for being accepted into society but also like there are some things I want to keep private for myself that like only my most privileged people get to see, you know, like, for, for example, I did stand up for a long time before telling anyone about it because it's trashy. And that's where I would go to really, I mean, not be trashy, but just like be in a different space. And I really enjoyed those space. And I, I really wanted to protect that world from my world here. Like I have a persona here and I have a persona in my stand-up space and I like those things being separate. I don't want, except for y'all, I don't want people <laughs> at my job to know the kinds of jokes that I make, yeah. you know? You would never say those things in the operating room or... Yeah, and I, I wouldn't even want some of the people that I work with to accompany me there. But, but it's all to say, like, the place where I landed on this is what you kind of said about the patient, like at the end of the day, there's a reason that most clinicians personas are kind of bland and inoffensive. And it's because we're not the main character. Like when people come to the hospital, we are entering their reality, not the other way around. Like they're the ones that need the help. And if, if a clinical encounter was a movie, then the side character drawing attention away from the lead would be a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, maybe in a few years, there will be an Iggy Pop United Medical Center <laughs> or a, a Sex Pistols Community Health Center, an institution. That, and Michalina will start it. And I will be it. their first hire. Yeah. <laughs> we will all work there. You know, unequivocally letting you know, you know, we not only tolerate these style choices, we embrace them. And we can bring That's our dogs and our cats. Mm. Okay, yeah. I'm now I'm fantasizing about this workplace that you But you know, it's all to say that like there is value in uniformity when you go to work. I like moving between worlds and keeping them separate a little bit. Yeah. 
But I can also appreciate wanting to be yourself wherever you go. But also, no one gets that. No one gets to be, not even Jeff Bezos. To appropriate a term from linguistics, you have to learn to code switch. Yeah. Mm. Right. Love that term. Yeah. So, I, like I said, I don't know. Work the system in a way that works for you. Well, hang on. I will say one last thought. Oh. Never in the history of society has it been, you know, more welcome to stand out a little bit. And and I, I think the best thing to come back to is kind of what we said at the beginning, which is like there are ways for you to I hate to use the word sell, but like there are ways for you to sell this as like this is why this is meaningful. Like I'm not just a little kid, you know, who who spent a little too much time working at Hot Topic and I'm now carrying it forward in my like I choose to color my hair this way because of X, Y, Z. It's an intentional choice. Maybe there's a story there. Maybe there's meaning. And so, you know, the personal statement is a place to be like, here's why this matters to me. And then the person who walks into the interview kind of excited to hear about why you pierced your, you know, like tattoos. So like we were talking about this the other day. It is extremely new to see healthcare providers with tattoos. That has never Mm -hmm. been the case. Because now I, you're seeing doctors with <laughs> neck tattoos. I'm looking forward to uh, to uh, to hearing about a physician that looks like Post Malone or somebody. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the under yeah. eye tie. Yeah, just like, tired it's to your stay job. T- My, to your job. It's the resident's <laughs> tattoo is they they tattoo over their eye bags and it just says always tired. Oh my god. <laughs> it's a little tear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or you know, yeah. yeah, maybe it's not that deep. Yeah. And that's totally, then our answer changes. Yeah. yeah. Right. I was so. just thinking that because like maybe she just wanted to hear like, yeah, you can like do it. Like, yeah, maybe you, blonde is good or. Pick yeah. Up I don't know. Maybe we're I overanalyzing <laughs> this. But I, I think we had to make it for bigger than just Michalina because I do think this is a problem that is not just, yeah. there's a whole spectrum of people who identify with this being their problem, which is how will my outward appearance affect my ability to do the thing that I really want to do in life? And I think it's a really important topic to think about, not just from kind of the perspective of fun colored hair, cool piercings, but it's also really important to think about in terms of black women have always thought this. And you had mentioned this before with black women's hair. And so this is a problem that spans much more than just Michalina. Mm -hmm. It is a problem that is like really important to think about, which is this intersection between professionalism and your personal expression of yourself, because at the end of the day, doctors who are just, you know, little robots and clones of each other, that's not what we want. But there is a balance between little clone robots and every single person yeah. for themselves. So we're trying to find that balance and yeah, and like who gets, stumbled over our words at some who point. Who gets so. to say what what's professional, right? Maybe. Us in 40 years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, whoever's I, in charge. Let so me that's... tell you something. I'm going to be checking up on y'all <laughs> in 40 years and find out if you're walking the walk, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Watch me be dressed like Michalina in 40 years. I'm going to eat my words. <laughs> <laughs> All right, look. Amazing question, Michalina. Thank you. Let us know what you determine. That's our show. Alina, Riley, Levi, thank you for being on the show with me today. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. And uh, what kind of idiot would I be if I didn't thank you, Short Coats, for making us a part of your week? If you're new and you like what you heard today, follow the show wherever fine podcasts are available, like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. Thank you to this week's producer, Matt Engelken, and to our editor, Katie Hyam Kessler. This show is made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine Student Government and ongoing support from the Writing and Humanities Program. Our music is by Dr. Vox and Caposphere. <laughs> I'm Dave Etler saying, don't let the bastards get you down. Talk to you in one week. Hi, short coats. Look, life in medical education... Life in America, life in the world is often difficult, and I often wish I could help. All I have is this podcast, but in my wildest dreams, you have the support you need to lead a life of your choosing. You deserve to be happy, healthy, and successful in whatever ways you define those words. So if you need support because you've experienced racism, discrimination, harassment, mental health crises, I want you to be able to get the help that you need And so I'm going to put some links in the show notes to some resources that you can use. But the bottom line is that for what it's worth, I see you. I know you're out there. 
I wish I could do more. Maybe I can in ways that I don't understand yet or know about, but I see you and I'm glad you're here and other people are too. This Short Code Podcast is a proud member of the MedEd Media Network. Inspiration, information, and guidance on your journey to medical school and beyond at mededmedia.com.